Back of my hair, is it all right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you gotta remember that. <laughs> you know, if, I, if I don't see it, I don't care about it. <laughs> you know. It is such an honor to be a part of these conventions all these years. God's been so good and gracious to us. And uh, we were talking about the, when I first came, or well, actually the first meeting I actually did with Brother Copeland was a motorcycle rally way back when. And uh, it was just such a, then it wasn't the Eagle Mountain Motorcycle, it was a full gospel motorcycles association, I think. And uh, it was just such a blessing. Little did I realize at that time that God would be entwining our destinies and it's been like that ever since. I want to minister tonight on something that is very dangerous when you got Kenneth Copeland and Keith Moore and Jerry Seville. I'm going to preach on Mark 11, 23 and 24. <laughs> They done squeezed every drop out that sucker, I think. Uh, but uh, Brother Hagen preached on it over 60 years and couldn't get it through. Amen. So uh, uh, I believe you're going to learn something tonight. So if you've got your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 11. We're going to be ministering on this wise. And then we'll be going over to 2 Kings, chapter 4. And uh, we'll be dealing with that. As you're turning to Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Yeah. I was ready for him too, glory to God. Um, on, on New Year's Eve 2012, last year, I went before the Lord because I believe in direction from the Holy Spirit. I love this scripture, how be it when the spirit of truth has come, he would guide us in all truth. I don't struggle, and I don't mean this in an arrogant sense, I don't struggle with decisions in my life, whether they be spiritual, physical, or financial, because I stand so firm and so strong on that. I believe it's St. John 16. How be it when the spirit of truth has come and he's come, he would guide me in all truth, not some truth, but all truth. But I, I like to know his mind. I, I am an avid thinker. I'm, I mean, Kathy says, Jesse don't have plan A and B. He got A through Z. Because you got to understand there are a lot of idiots in the world. And the minute you think you got it idiot proof, somebody creates a new idiot. And I don't like hesitation. I like if you believe, I'm the kind of person, if you say you're going to do something, then you're burning daylight, let's go do this. So I went before the Lord on New Year's Eve at my home because the next day would be New Year's Day and We've been doing this for many, many years, me and Kathy, just ourselves. We go in our dining room, and now I have a chapel. I built a chapel for God to reside in, like the old covenant in my home. And um, it's gorgeous. It's got pews in it and everything. It's beautiful. And uh, I said, you know, if you want to come in here with the blue smoke, that's okay with me, you know. Because the next day we would go come before him with Holy Communion, me and Kathy. And thank God for all the things that he did for us in that year. And, what, and then call those things that be not as though they were for the year that we were going in the New Year. It's called New Year's Day and we take communion. But the, day, the night before, actually early evening, I said, Lord, what would you have me minister on? What would you have me do in 2013? And he gave me this wonderful statement, believe the unbelievable and receive the impossible. And then he said this statement, if you're not believing the unbelievable, you're really not believing. And the more I thought of the word of the living God, everything God says is unbelievable and impossible, but it's doable. He says, totally doable. So I have been majoring on that theme and uh, throughout my, on, on my ministry, if you drive around my ministry, you'll see those signs if you go into our church, which I'm not the pastor of. In fact, Pastor Nathaniel Wolf is now pastor of Covenant Church. They're around here somewhere and just wonderful, praise the Lord, and doing a phenomenal job. We got these banners, believe the unbelievable and receive the impossible. And everything I've ever done in my life has been unbelievable and impossible. I think sometimes people think I lie about some of these stories, but I've lived a very full life. And next week, Tuesday, I'm going to be able to uh, fulfill Paul McCartney's song when I am 64. I'll be 64 years old this Tuesday coming. And uh, I've lived a very, very full life. I hate to say for the devil and also for the Lord before I became born again. My own doctor said I wouldn't live past 27 years old because of the amount of drinking I did as a, as a young man. I would have cirrhosis of the liver by the time I was 21. But thank God that the Lord protected my body even though I was stupid, you know, because young believes it's forever. 
you know, that kind of stuff. But when the Lord came into my life, I made up my mind I would do what he said no matter what. Now, there's some things he said I don't particularly care for. I, I'm not, I've always been honest with God. I said, I, I don't like this. He said, I didn't ask you if you liked it. I said, I just want to let you know I'm going to do this, but I don't like it. But I'm going to do it with a good heart. And I would do that because I, I couldn't see the end result. And then when I saw the end result, then I realized how dumb I was to say I, I didn't like it because it was unbelievable. And it was impossible, but yet it was doable. So in Mark chapter 11, verse 23, first I want to say this. Most people have never really heard what Jesus said. They heard ministers with commentary, with homiletics, hermeneutics, philosophy, theology. I'm very interested in what he said because he can't lie. And I have convinced myself that he can't lie. So when he tells me to do something unbelievable and impossible, I said, okay. Actually, it's just literally that simple. And he never checks your bank account when he tells you to do something. Everything God tells you to do is expensive. I asked him one time, I said, can you tell me to do something cheap? He said, I'm not cheap. I said, forget what I said. Everything. And I remember it when I first started out, it was in a couple of dollars, three dollars. Now it's in the millions. God ain't told me nothing to do that costs less than two or three to four million dollars in everything I've ever done. And he'll add, uh, oh, millions and millions of dollars just, just that quick. And I say, that's unbelievable, but impossible. And I realize that I'm not that good enough to generate that kind of money, but he does. So he does his job, I do my job, and it gets done. So in Mark chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain. So notice we're supposed to talk to mountains. But you see what has happened is through the body of Christ, the, men, the word of God has been distorted and I call it distortion, genetically altered Christianity. They never asked you to talk to the mountain. They made you become a mountain climber instead of a mountain dissolver. See, and you can spend your whole Christian life climbing, uh, actually climbing a mountain you should have dissolved. Get almost to the top, slide down, kill yourself. Knock your grandma out going down at the same time. So I decided never to climb a mountain, but to dissolve it. He says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea. Now Mark 11, verse 23, if you look at that verse, God's not in that verse. Holy Ghost is not in that verse. Jesus is not in that verse. The only thing in that verse is you. This is what Jesus believes you can do. When are we going to believe what Jesus believes about us? Are we going to wait another millennium? Are we going to wait another century? When are we going to just flat believe what he said we could do? He says you can do this. So if he can't lie, then it's amazing what I can do. It's amazing what you can do if you believe what he believes about you. So he says, Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. So notice he also gives you the option and tells you to tell the mountain where to go. Now, I don't know why you have a problem telling the mountain where to go because you tell everybody else where to go. <laughs> you ain't got no problem telling somebody else where to go. Why can't you tell your mountain where to go? Now, the only place you can hide a mountain, many people have said this, is in the ocean or in the sea. So in other words, you should always see clearly. Now, I know you say look through a glass darkly, but that's people that's not receiving the fullness of the revelation of God. You see, they're so far into homiletics, hermeneutics, philosophy, and theology and traditions of men that they miss the wonderful things that God has for them. So he says, Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. He didn't say anything about doubt in your head. Everybody in this building, including Jesse Duplantis, gets doubt in their head. Thoughts come into your mind uninvited. You didn't ask for them. They just come flying there. Well, what should I do? Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of the anointed one in his anointing. Well, how do I do that? By casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity. So when I get an ugly thought, and sometimes I do, I say, that's not my thoughts. My thoughts are lovely, just, good, report, and pure and virtuous. I shall think on these things. And besides, this is my mind, and you don't have a right to invade in my mind. Are you hearing it? Oh, I'm going I'm to do a little preaching and teaching if you don't mind. I'm going to buy this tape myself. Lord Jesus, I feel it coming on. So I've learned that I may get doubt in my head, but so as long as you don't tra transmit it or transfer it to your heart. 
Now, how do you transfer doubt in the head to your heart? You do it by saying it. The minute you say it, you own it. And I've said this many times, if you have a wife or you have a girlfriend and she happens to say, honey, does this dress make my rear end look big? Do not answer that question because you're going to own it for the rest of your life. You understand? Just say it looks wonderful, but everything's fine. Glory to God. And then repent later, but at least just, just don't answer the question. See, because the minute you say something, you transfer, you own what you say. Title of this message tonight is your power is in your saying and believing. So let's go again. Verily I say unto you, who shall ever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things. Shall believe those things. Shall believe those things. Not believe the words about the things, but believe for the things. See, a lot of people believe more in the confession than they do about the thing. They keep believing, believing, believing. I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing. But you're not believing for the thing. You just believe it. You're believing the words about the things instead of believing for the thing. Now, why did the church world freak out over things? God don't mind you having things. The church world does. The secular world does. People get so mad at me because I fly a jet. It ain't my fault. It's Brother Copeland's fault. <laughs> He's the one that taught me to believe for something like that. He's the one that helped me bust through the barrier that, bless God, I could get beyond a new car and get to an airplane. Do you understand that? And all it is is the transportation tool to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus. I, it may be luxurious, I guess it is, but to me, when I look at one, it's work. I, I burn up, I've owned three jets, glory to God. I just burn them up for Jesus, about ready to get a fourth one. Why? Because that's what I need to preach the gospel. Now, some people get mad at me. And them jets cost $20 million, $30 million. Yeah, they do. But you know, they don't, they don't get mad if some preacher spends $25 million, $30 million on, on a sanctuary that seats 10,000 people. And you know why? Because that's what he needs to preach to his congregation. But since I'm not a pastor, what I need to preach to my congregation, which is the world, is the aircraft. So why would it be wrong for me to have that? You go criticize the guy that built the big building. Because that's what he needs. And Kathy, the one that explained that to me, we were flying to Rod Parsons, and I was thinking, am I spending too much on this plane? Lord, gee, that's a lot of money. And Kathy said, how much do you think Rod Parsley paid for this place? I said, oh, God, at least $25, $30 million. And that's what she said. That's what he needs to preach to his congregation. You don't need that kind of building. What you need is this kind of plane. And I thought, that's correct. I said, you need to go with me more often. <laughs> and I'll let you talk to those people. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things. Not the words about the things. Believe those things. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. You know what I'm saying? Things. Things. Ain't bad. God don't care what you drive. He don't care what you wear. He don't care. He, I mean, what are you going to do when you get to heaven? And you can't find a trailer. And you can't find a, 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 a you know, a beat up place. Uh, the hood. There ain't no hood. In my father's house are many. What makes a mansion a mansion? One word. Big. Have you seen a trailer mansion? No, you ain't seen no trailer mansion. Nothing wrong with a trailer. I'm not, I'm not being critical of that. But I'm saying you, you're going to have to make up your mind that you are going to live in a big place. Well, when we get to heaven, no, no. See, that's genetically, genetically distorted Christianity. His will be done where? Where? Then what are you waiting for to get to heaven to get what you can have here? Because you're climbing that mountain instead of dissolving that mountain. Let me start again. Verily I say unto you, who shall ever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith, shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. Now watch, distorted, genetically altered Christianity. Yeah, that's right, if it be his will. Ah, no, 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 no. He ain't talking about his will there. He's talking about your will. He ain't talking about his will. He said, what you desire, delight yourself therefore in the Lord. I'll give you the desires of your heart. Pray like the psalmist David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The young lions do suffer lack, but he that seeks my face shall not want for any good thing. Now, what part of that you don't understand? You understand what I'm saying? Let me start again. Verily I say unto you, 
that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things, not the words about the things, those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, then I'm a, the next verse is so powerful, verse 24, therefore I say unto you. Now, Brother Hagin said, anytime you see a therefore, find out what it's there for. Remember Brother Hagin saying that? That's a connecting word, which means there's more to come. This is part two. So therefore I say unto you, what things? Now notice it, we're still dealing with things, so ever you desire. Who, who desire? That when you pray, when you pray, believe that you receive. Not when you get it, not when you manifest. I heard Keith Moore preach on that. But when you pray, believe that you receive. Now I'm going to stop right there and you shall have it. Let me just give you an example. In 1978, I, was, I started out in full-time ministry. I've been preaching. In, I did my first message in January, the first week of January 1976. And uh, I never wanted to be in the ministry. I was not interested in that. But, you know, they, they, I had a testimony because I was a rocker. And they wanted to hear all that kind of stuff, you know. I got born again. But it began to develop and God put me in the ministry. So I'm driving on, a, a, on the street on Highway 167. I passed by the Lafayette Municipal Airport. Now, you got to understand, I was driving a Toyota and gas was 59 cents a gallon and I couldn't fill up the car. And it had a 10-gallon tank. Now, before I worked for the Lord, I made more money you could shake a stick at. But you see, I thought it was right to be poor. I thought, well, you just got to be poor. I was willing to be poor because I was raised poor. Now, I, I, I wasn't ashamed of my mom and dad, but they did the best they could. And that was because they did not have enough knowledge See, knowledge is power, but you got to have wisdom, the ability to use it so you can receive what power will bring to you. So you'll be superior to that power instead of driven by it. So you got to have wisdom and knowledge connected together, working so that you don't mess yourself up, mess other people up at the same time. So I thought, well, when I got out of the music business, I was making money. I'm, I'm talking, I'm a hand over fist. I'm talking money here. You understand? Because I'm talented. Ask Jerry Zavelle, he'll tell you. He's heard me play guitar. He said, Jesse, you can do something. I can do that. Oh, yeah, I can, I can freak out some kids. They call me that old cool dude. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's what I did for a living. I made money for God. I was getting out that hole. You got to understand, at six years old, I told my mama, I want a guitar. I saw a black man. I, we were poor. The black people live across. We were the poor white trash, and there was the poor black trash. We live on the same street. What <laughs> much of a street? They called us white trash. That's what they called us. Trailer trash, white trash, other things, you know, but they called us that kind of stuff. Never was a real concrete road. It was a gravel road. That's just the way it was. And it was a trailer with a, <laughs> with a room <laughs> built on the side of it. You call that your a living room. <laughs> and Miss Ethel lived across the street. And she had that real high voice, come here, little Jesse. That's how she talked. What's wrong with that woman? Man, somebody must have scared her and it never came off of her. Ah! So just, just high voice. But her father was, oh, he was an elderly uh, black gentleman. He must have been 80 years old and used to go out on the porch. They had a house with no air conditioning. I mean, you didn't have no air conditioning in them days. You just sweat. Just sweat. And he'd come out there and he, sometimes he didn't have uh, six strings on the guitar. He might have one. Didn't have no teeth, and we'd sing his tongue come flying out of his mouth, come flying back in. He would have that, 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 that. And sometimes you just couldn't look at him, just listen to the sound. I don't want to look at him. I want to put a little humor in this because I'm reliving this as I, as I uh, uh, see this. And he'd go, do, and everything with the blues because everything was blue. Man, nobody had anything. I mean, you know, thieves brought stuff to our house. You know what I'm saying? We were poor. You know what I'm saying? We just flat. Or, watch this now. And he'd go, dum, 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 And here's this little white boy, five, six years old. Yeah, 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 Lord. <laughs> boy, I mean, I just begin to fall in love with like, He said, come on, we're just a, la, 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 la. So I'd go, ha, ha, yeah, yeah, and all that kind of stuff like that. <laughs> Miss Esther, look at him, he's trying to be black. <laughs> That's what she said. He's trying to be black. Boy, if Miss Ethel was living today, I said, if you'd have knew my family, I might have been black. I don't know. <laughs> we, don't, we just took whatever came from the hospital. That's all it was. <laughs> Man, we never argue about nothing. Glory to God. Ain't no telling what you're going to get. That's all I'm going to say about that because they're all in heaven now. But anyway, 
Well, it gave me, I, 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 that was that opportunity that Brother Jerry was preaching about. I want a guitar. Now, you got to understand, when you cut a, you could cut an acre of grass for 50 cents. I mean, you know. And so I was, I, I knew my daddy wasn't going to give me no money and have nothing. I was just a small boy, six years old kid. So I said, Mama, I want a guitar. She said, Boy, we can't afford no guitar. So I had $4.16 I had saved from cutting grass. I said, Mama, I want you to get here. I said, hold this for me. I don't know what I got to do to get a guitar. She said, she pushed that money back on the kitchen table. We didn't have no dining room table. We had a kitchen table. Everything happened in the kitchen. Everything happened in the kitchen. Lord, did. I mean, you got happy in the kitchen, you got mad in the kitchen. You cuss in the kitchen and you praise God in the kitchen. Everything was in the kitchen. She slid that $4.16 back to me. She said, you, you keep your money, Jesse. I'll get your daddy to do it. I said, well, do something to him, mama. Do something to him. <laughs> I mean, I used to hear him argue for about two weeks. Said, nah, 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 nah. And, you know, daddy cussed a little bit. Mama, mama was, both of them were saved, but not too sanctified. So they cussed a little bit, you know. <laughs> they, they, they saved, but they weren't sanctified. I don't think they knew what sanctified meant. I think they thought Santa fried or something. Something was fried. <laughs> I don't, I don't think they even knew that word, sanctified. So they cuss a little bit, and, and I learned to cuss like that myself. <laughs> Finally, Daddy said, I'm taking you downtown New Orleans. Talk like this. My dad used to talk like this. I'm going to tell you something, boy. I'm going to take you down to New Orleans Music. I'm going to buy you a guitar, huh? <laughs> I brought yourself over here right now. So I brought myself over there. <laughs> That's a Cajun. See what I'm saying? Went down, to, down on Canal Street. And that's when I encountered the first time in my life Jews. Mama said, look, Jesse, that's God's people. I said, well, what are we? She said, we're heathens. That's what Mama said. That's exactly what Mama said. I said, well, okay. I wouldn't care if I was a heathen or not. I just want a silver tone guitar. I said, Mama, I'll drive you nuts with that guitar. You better learn to play that guitar. I said, I'll play it. And of course, Dad got it. I don't know where he got that $20. Because $20 is a lot of money in the days. Let me give you an idea how much $20 was. Uh, a scoop of ice cream was a nickel. You could buy a Coke for a nickel. A loaf of bread was 15 cents. A gallon of milk was 18 cents. So you got 20 bucks. You had some money. But when I'm in, wow, I was so proud, man. I just begin to play, you know. And I'd go over and I'd let Mrs. Ethel's father teach me a few things, you know. And, and boy, I mean, and then after a while, I was, I was playing with him, both of them. And I would strum a little bit. And he said, take the lead. I said, well, lead what? What's a lead? I, didn't, I had no idea, you know. And he'd begin to show me things of rhythm. And, and he said, now, you can't. You, you're a little too white. You got to get a little black. <laughs> and I said, well, what does that mean? He said, because, you know, uh, uh, the white person comes down on the first beat and the black person comes down on the second beat. He said, the white person is this. Black person. Says the second beat. He said, you got to move a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And hum some, that'll help you. But you see, I was learning. I wanted to, I wanted to do what he did. Because I, I figured, and I saw that guitar, I said, this is my way out this hole. I figured I'm going to get out this hole and I'm going to use that guitar to do it. And to make a long story short, that's exactly what happened. That guitar took me out the hole. And, you know, I began to play music. I mean, I was a pretty good uh, musician at nine years old. I mean, I mean, people throw money at me, quarters. So I stopped playing and grabbed the money. <laughs> I, mean, I go, wow, I can make money on this, man. So I'd play at school and they'd throw me their lunch money. I am doing good. Of course, I lost it with gambling two or three times, you know, but I mean, until <laughs> the priest caught me, he said, you're gambling at the house of God. I said, you need some help. What you going to do? <laughs> Now, I'm saying all this for a reason. And as soon as I figure out what that reason is, I'll let you know. <laughs> no, no, I know where I'm at. Let me tell you something. I know exactly where I'm at. Therefore, the things that I desire. That was a desire of mine. And so I'm driving on Highway 167 to go preach a meeting. And I had done what the gospel said I should do. Be poor. Gave my money away. Me and Kathy came home. Gave all our money away. Lord Jesus. And as I was driving, I want you to remember this story because I'm, I'm going to take you back to it toward the end of the message. I passed by the airport and the Lord and a citation jet flew over my car and the Lord spoke to me. I heard it with my audible. I heard it. It was audible to me. It may not have been audible. He said, look up. And I looked up and I saw this jet and he said, I'm going to give you a plane. And I thought, I, you know what I thought? Man, I can't even fill up a Toyota. Huh? I'm going to get a plane. There ain't no way I can get a plane. And God gave me one of the greatest statements he ever gave me in my life. 
It's still so strong in me. And he said, Jesse, Jesse, I didn't ask you to pay for it. I asked you to believe for it. See, genetically distorted, altered Christianity tells you to pay for it. Jesus tells you to believe for it. When you pray, believe that you receive it. Not when you get it. Not when it manifests. It has nothing to do with payment. It has to do with believing. And I want you to remember that. So I, I got so excited. Now, I'm a young preacher. You understand? I'm, 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 I'm 28 years old going into full-time ministry. I may have been in the ministry, what, two weeks, three weeks, I'm going to preach for this man. And I, I, I couldn't wait to tell this preacher who had been in the ministry at least 15 years. And I said, you ain't going to believe this. And I was right. He didn't believe it. <laughs> I said, God said he's going to give me an airplane, a jet. He looked at me and said, Jesse, you can't fill up a Toyota. How you going to get a jet? You know, I didn't ask him for any money. I didn't ask him for a dime. I just asked him for belief. But his believing was not equal to his belief. He didn't have a belief system, much less a believing system. I didn't ask him no money. I mean, it kind of hurt my feelings, but I, I, I put that on the back burner. I said, I don't care what he said. That's what the Lord said. Now that I've owned three jets, that preacher for the last 15 years has been wanting to fly with me. I ain't letting that fool get in my plane. <laughs> We'd crash for sure. Remember what I said there, because I'm going to come back to that statement. Okay. I didn't ask you to pay for it. I asked you to believe for it. Are you getting that? So, therefore, what things ever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive, and you shall have it. Now, let me tell you another story, then I'm going to get into the scripture. I very seldom ever go shopping with Kathy. Because you see, ladies, you've got to understand something about a man. Let me help you. When a man said, let's walk the mall, that's exactly what he means. <laughs> that, he ain't going in the store. He can walk the mall. Then when he get to the end of the mall, he go on the other side of the mall and he walk. Now you want to go in the store. What you want to go in the store for? Woman, let's walk the mall. Am I right? Men, men just want to walk the mall. See, well, woman want to, women try on or look at stuff that don't even fit them. My Lord, they pull out a two and a four dress and their leg is a 16. They can't even get that thing. They can't, they can't put their leg in that dress. But they're going to hold on. You know, I, I don't know if they believe it. I don't know what they're doing. Well, Kathy likes nice things. That's fine with me. So this is really a nice store in New Orleans called Saks Fifth Avenue. You might have one here in the Fort Worth area. Now, in Saks Fifth Avenue in New Orleans, they got Escada and, and Chanel and Louis Vuitton. And Kathy got an array of purses that will just make women's mouth just drool. I mean, she got all that stuff. Okay, that's fine. Eh? So she heads straight for that Louis Vuitton section. Now, there ain't nothing in there I want. You know, I don't carry a purse. Yeah, but you can have a man purse. Your mama, I ain't carrying no man purse. <laughs> I, that, that ain't me. I'm not, I'm not homophobic. I just ain't carrying no purse. <laughs> so, I'm standing by the Louis Vuitton section. And I'm just standing there. All of a sudden, I see this black lady go. Now, she don't know me, I don't know her. Watch this. She looks and she goes. Whoo. Whoo. And I look at her and I said, oh, she must like these Louis Vuitton purses and stuff because it's a beautiful display right there. You know? She goes. <laughs> and she just walked off. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, you see that? I said, yeah. He says, I want her to have it. I said, well, what you talking to me for? That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a viable question. He said, you know why she's not getting it? I said, why? He said, she's trying to figure out how to pay for it. I didn't ask her to pay for it. I asked her to believe for it. Because what things, is a Louis Vuitton purse a thing? Yeah. What things ever you desire. But see, the reason why she ain't getting it, because she's trying to figure out how to pay for it. Instead of believable. So I'm just standing there still waiting on cat. All of a sudden, he went about maybe three or four minutes later. Here she come back. She look at it again. And you know, black women are very expressive. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of got that head. They kind of shake that head, you know. They got that little switch. Hmm. <laughs> Snap that finger. 
And then she turned around, walked off again. I had made up my mind. I said, that woman come back here. I'm going to buy her any purse she wants. I don't know her. I don't care. I was so glad she didn't come back. <laughs> she didn't come back. Here. She didn't come back. Why didn't she get it? She was trying to figure out how to pay for it. How many times you on a Saturday with your husband go drive to a nice house and you go, oh, Lord, look at this house. Oh, Lord, look at this house. Now, you're not believing God for the people that are inside the house for God to throw them out in the street. No. But you go, oh, and you drive off. You know why you keep coming back? That's your house. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching that. That's your house. But the reason why you don't have it, you're trying to figure out how to pay for it. When God is just telling you to believe for it. See, it's unbelievable. It's impossible. But it's doable. What things ever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive. Now, you see, what happens is, do, do through, uh, through distorted, genetically altered Christianity, they pick up this when they read that scripture, that when you pray, pay. When God ain't got paying on his mind, when you pray, believe that you receive. But you're picking that up. Well, yeah, I don't mind having that. That's about how I'm going to get the money to do that. That's not your job. It's your job to have a desire, to believe for the thing, not the words about the things. Not to pray and pay, but pray and believe that you receive and you shall have it. So every time God tells me to do this, I don't try to figure out how to pay for it. I used to do that until he told me that statement. I didn't ask you to pay for it. I ask you to believe for it. So write this down quickly if you don't mind and, you, and uh, you'll be blessed by this here. The whole of scripture has nothing to do with what you can do by yourself. The whole of scripture has nothing to do with what you can do by yourself. It's not you, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. When God told me to buy a plane, I thought, you know, planes cost money. He said, I didn't ask you to pay for it. I asked you to believe for it. Now, you know, I am a businessman. I believe in that. I believe in budgets, and all, but I never deal with a budget, but I have a budget. When I go preach somewhere, I don't say nothing wrong with that. But, but I realize that to me, this is the way I believe budgets cost you something, vision bring you something. So I deal with my vision. And the budget is just, it, 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 that's going to come. I ain't worried about that. It's with the vision. See, the vision, because re vision really begins once the budget is met. Because there ain't too many people giving away buildings like this for free. Cost money, the lights, everything you can think of, it's all in the cost of that. So the whole of scripture has nothing to do with what you can do by yourself. Now everything God does, watch this, God always challenges us to believe what the natural mind and the senses cannot grasp. Everything God's ever told me to do is beyond my natural mind and my senses to grasp it. But I am not believing with my mind. I'm, believe, I'm, I'm transforming my mind. I am believing with my spirit who is in total 100% contact with God. You understand what I'm saying? And has the revelation of what God can do. Where the, where the break off is, is when your mind is not renewed as I preached the other day, it's conformed instead of being transformed. That's why he says that you may prove. Why do you have to prove it? Because you've got to transform what's up here. You don't need a heart bypass, you need a head bypass. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Once you get this, then everything God tells you to do, he, well, I'll just give you an idea. Just this, just this year, he's, I'm believing for $78 million over and above my normal operating budget of Jesse the Plans Ministry, which is millions a month. $78 million. That don't more bother God and the man in the moon. He's the one to come up with that figure. I'd like to just slide a little bit. I said, listen, if you want to slow this puppy down, let's slow it down. And he just keeps cranking. Let's go. Then I realize he's in a hurry because he's coming. Do you understand? Jesus is coming. And sooner than most of you people think he's coming. I'm not just saying that to get you excited. I'm telling you he's coming. Now, when will we believe what he believes about us? Because once you tell somebody what Jesus believed about you, you can hear this. Who do you think you are? Which is how much time you got. Sit your ugly self down. I'm going to tell you what I can do. I don't mean that to be rude, you see, but God tells me this. You got to understand something. Everything he tells me to do is beyond my senses and beyond my mind. Why is he telling me to believe the unbelievable and receive the impossible? Why? Write this down. Because your future is worth saving. You have a phenomenal future. If you'll understand what God's already done, quit trying to become what you already are. 
See, once you understand what you already are, all this struggle in life quits and things begin to take place. Your future is worth saving. Only God's word can give you wisdom and strength to see all desires come to pass. You've got to have God's word to give you wisdom and strength to see the desires come to pass. And people say, well, that's greed. No, it ain't greed, it's growth. Can't you understand? It's growth. It's God say you now developed enough that you can receive an aircraft without getting a big head. We call it uh, uh, prideful. You know, we call it the big head in South Louisiana. You know, you can start receiving these things without just trying to say, well, let me tell you what I got. All that kind of stuff. Because now you're able to function on a higher level because pride is no longer a part of your life. So your future is worth saving. I have a beautiful future. I have a marvelous future, see. And I've learned not to quit trying to pay for something, but just believe for something. And I never forget that. He said, I didn't ask you to pay for it. I asked you to believe for it. And when I got, I, I got that, and all of a sudden, I remember it was, it, as I began to develop, one day I got a phone call, and it was like, it was like I don't know, 11.50, uh, 10 minutes to 12. And this is years and years ago. And to make a long story short, they said, Kenneth Colton's on the phone. I said, oh, okay. And I called, I said, hello, Brother Colton. He said, Jesse, when can you get up here? I said, what? He said, when can you get up here? So I, I thought he was just joking or something. And I said, well, Delta Airlines got a flight at 105. Now this is 10 minutes to 12. Get on it. I just think I found your plane. He said, fly here. I'll send somebody to pick you up because then we're going to go in my plane and go look at this thing. Man, I, I, I said, okay, brother. Caught my hunger. I said, can I? I said, we're going to Dallas. She said, I got to go home change. Forget it, woman. <laughs> I got to go to the bathroom. Said, no, go. We got to go. Boy, I mean, we ran to that plane. I mean, Delta flew us. And we landed at DFW. Brother Colton had somebody from his ministry pick us up. Boom! We came to hit, uh, Eagle Mountain, got in his plane, and flew out to Canada. And, show, and, br and he brought his uh, mechanic with him. Darrow, I think his name, Darren, something like that. And man, he was looking over the thing. And I, when I saw that plane, I said, that's mine. It's unbelievable, but it's impossible, but it is doable. It was my first jet. I was so excited. And I remember when the Lord, I said, that's that jet. Now, I don't know if that was the physical jet that I saw. But that's that jet. He said, it has begun. You now able to receive. You've taken on the responsibility of giving, but you've struggled with the responsibility of receiving. See, a lot of Christians, they can receive little stuff, but I'm talking about big stuff. I'm talking about big things. You understand what I'm saying? And I looked at that, and that plane happened to belong to Mr. Harvey Firestone, Jr. Man, I was excited. Boy, and I liked the way that man did business. Now, this is way back when, you understand what I'm saying? And he looked at me. <laughs> I got to meet the, the gentleman. I said, well, Mr. Firestone, can I give you a, I, this is my plane. Can I give you a down, a payment or something, or a deposit to hold it? And he looked at me. He must have been in the 80s. He said, is your word your bond I said, Mr. Feinstein, I tell you something, you can take it to the bank. He said, shake my hand. I'm sure how he did that. He said, look me in the eye. And I looked him in the eye. He said, I don't like lawyers. I don't like all this stuff. This is the way we used to do business. Plain's yours. I thought, okay. I said, well, when do you want the money? He said, I don't want it this year. This was in November of 94. He said, anytime in 95. I said, January the 6th, 95? Because I was ready to get into that plane. Lord Jesus, I was just so excited. He, he said, that'll be fine because we had to get it registered out of Canada, get it registered in the United States. And sure enough, come, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you this. So now it was $250,000 more. As he walked to the thing, there was, a, it's called an Eagle Mod, which means it, it carries more fuel than the normal citation. He stopped and turned around. And he looked and said, at Eagle Mod, now they, they had added a price of $250,000 more on that aircraft. He said, uh, give that to the Reverend, that's yours. I said, Thank you, Jesus. I'm buying Firestone tires for the rest of my life. <laughs> Do you know going to purchase an aircraft, I had a quarter of a million dollar gift given to me. Not in cash, but in the plane. Cut it off. It was such a blessing. And we flew it. Now watch it. Still don't know till today. 95, we flew it. And I, Brother Copeland told me about a guy. I said, he said, Jesse, you need to put Jesse and Kathy in there. So I, I said, what do I do? He said, change that, that, uh, the interior. And the interior was nice, to miss but you want yourself in there. You know, I said, okay. So I flew, and you know what? And I said, how much it cost? And it was $20,000 to do the interior back there. I thought, $20,000? Yeah, you got to put the air conditioning there. I said, man, I can go to Walmart and get one of them window air conditions for $100. <laughs> 
and just glue it on the side of the plane. I ain't got to spend no. You know, stupid, didn't have any sense. Could you imagine seeing a window unit on a jet? But you see, when you hadn't been there, when you don't know, when you don't know. When you don't know, you don't know. Do you know the man called me and said, your plane is ready, come pick it up? This was in Mississippi. Man, I was so excited. I said, okay, we drive over there. When I got there, I had my check for $20,000. I don't know, somebody had paid for it. Don't know till today. The money, I do know that the money came from England. Still don't know till today. Still been trying to find out why, so I could at least say thank you. I didn't, I, it was amazing. I paid cash for the plane. I mean, everything. And I just flew it, flew it for nine years. And then Keith Moore got that plane. How long did you fly? A year? If that much? Maybe not that much. I don't know, just three years? Yeah. And then the Lord moved on Brother uh, Keith to place it in Happy Caldwell's ministry. My first plane is still preaching the gospel. Am I right, Happy? That's right. You probably flew here at that plane. It was just, it's so wonderful. See, I've owned three jets and all three of them are still in the ministry. Believing the unbelievable and receiving the impossible. See, because your future is worth saving. I will not let any religious denomination or religious person limit me when I am unlimited. You understand? I realize that I am unlimited. Now, people say, that guy got so much money, Lord. Gee. I mean, if you, if you hear some of the people talk about me in New York, you think I'm Bill Gates Jr. So I believe with him. Okay. Bob said, if two of you agree, I agree with you. Now, I mean, I ain't broke by no means. I'm far from broke, Lord. And even Gene Jody said, boy, daddy, yeah, yeah, you mama just do anything. I said, yeah. <laughs> now, where did I learn that from? You see, Brother Copeland and Sister Gloria actually preached poverty out of me. Because I thought poverty was a blessing when it was nothing but a curse. You got to understand, I met Brother Copeland in an elevator. In fact, and he, he, he asked me, you going to the meeting? I said, yeah, but I didn't know he was the guest speaker at John Osteen's Thanksgiving convention. And when he walked up, I said, that's that guy in that elevator. Yeah, that very day, that, just that quick, what, 10 seconds? Hello, I'm Kenneth Copeland, I'm Jesse DePrint, that's it. Doors opened up, and he, he went to the car, they were picking him up, he's going to the meeting. Now, I didn't talk to Brother Copeland for a long time after that until Gloria came to New Orleans and preached at a place, and we went out and eat dinner, and Gloria said, Ken would like to get with you sometimes. I said, oh, that would be nice, you know. And, uh, and that's when, uh, what, what, a couple, three years passed, and that's when the motorcycle rally took place, and I'm standing on a, uh, I got, I'm saying this for a reason. I'm standing on a platform, Brother Colton got my hand, I guess, and Jerry Savelle's and we pray it. And he shakes my hand, looks at me, he said, would you pray about preaching one of my believers' conventions? I said, I can't. He said, what? I said, I, I, I am loaded to the gears. I, ain't gotta, I, I, I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it this year. I said, I can do it next year. He said, well, he'd love to. I said, but I can only do three services. I said, I'm loaded up. I'm preaching every day. Well, that would be fine. And that's how I started, thinking I'd preach maybe one at the most two, and that would be nice. And yet now that's become like, well, what, over 20-something years now. It's preaching all these conventions. See, see, it was unbelievable but impossible. Because you know what some preachers told me? You'll never preach with Kenneth Copeland. And I'll never forget the first time I preached that believers, man, that preacher that told me that was sitting right where you are, this young man, this young black gentleman. And I wanted to go, nah, 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 nah. But I didn't. I didn't. But I sure thought of it. See, it was unbelievable and impossible to him and to me, but it was doable. Because my destiny was tied there. But this, it wasn't only just so I could preach it. I had to learn some things. I didn't know how to play till I met Jerry Zavell and Kenneth Copeland. I didn't play. I worked. They, they told me you don't know how to play. I didn't know how to play. Let's ride a motorcycle. I have fallen all over Colorado on a motorcycle. <laughs> I've fallen all over. I've got to pick me up. Glory to God. And Gloria goes, he, boy, does he know how to drive a motorcycle? <laughs> yeah. But when your legs are short and, and you can't reach the bottom, <laughs> you're going down. And I went down many times. But, you know, they were courteous and kind. They were wonderful people. Just everybody's done it. Difference is we all saw you do it. <laughs> but I got them all back. We've been on some great motorcycle trips. Me and Jerry and Dennis and Happy. <laughs> we stopped at a store one time and there was some pickle sausage. 
You know, you ever seen sausage and pickled eggs? Oh, I'm telling you, man, you eat this stuff, you knock, you kill a mosquito 30 yards with your breath. <laughs> Whew, bam, just knock him down. Boy, well, I said, Brother Copeland, you want some of these? Yeah, I have a piece of that. I said, Dennis, remember that? I said, Dennis, you want some of that? Yeah. Boy, well, so we ate two or three of them little bald eggs and picked out. That sausage boy got on that motor. Oh, and all of a sudden my stomach go. I go, oh, Jesus. Oh, gee. All of a sudden Kathy goes, she's on the back. What was that? I said, that's roadkill. That's a roadkill. That's that old dead animal we passed there. <laughs> it's a true story. Don't laugh at me, because when we stopped at the bathroom, Dennis was running like an Olympic champion. I got to go. <laughs> that stuff will kill you. That ain't a negative confession, but that literally happened. I kind of felt pleased about it. Make y'all laugh at me. Let's got me falling down. I'm going to lock the bathroom door. You're going to dance around this baby. <laughs> Boy, I mean, he be beating the door. Hey, come on, Johnny, hurry up. <laughs> I'm behind the door going, ha, ha. We do have fun sometimes. <laughs> Faith is something I like to call spiritualized common sense. Write that down. Faith is something I like to call spiritualized common sense. You see, I don't think with my mind. I think with the word. So when God comes with something unbelievable, impossible, what, do I, what, what does my mind think? Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him was able to do exceedingly abundant of all we can possibly ask or think according to the power. What power? Say unto that mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea. What power? According to the power that worketh in us. What power? You're saying and you're believing. Not you're praying and you're paying. You're praying and you're believing. See, so even though I don't have this this, this, this is much way, and I got a pretty nice size jet, glory to God. I mean, that thing's nice, don't misunderstand me. But I'm going get, to get something bigger. Do I have it physically? Yes. It just hadn't manifested. Because when I prayed, you taught me that, Keith. Believe that you receive. I said, it's mine, it's it. So I bought the number. I registered the end. I got the end number. You got to have an end number. I don't know what the end stands for. I, I've owned three jets. You got to put an end. Why not an L? Why not a W? I don't know. Just an end is the way it works. I don't know. I, I've never been to that, you know, typewriting. They said, want, do you want to learn how to fly? No. Want to learn how to land? Just let me learn how to land. <laughs> That's all I need to know. If those boys pass out, then uh, I ain't saying it's going to be in great shape. I, I'm not saying a negative confession, but I believe I can get it on the ground. The other day we were coming down and a deer ran across us. We didn't hit him, but we scared him to death. We, I'm there, we almost landed on his back. I saw the white of his eyes. <laughs> Man, I tell you what, and my pilot's went, whoa, whoa. I've had Canadian geese come up on us, man. I've heard them say, pull to the left, pull to the left. And there's this big goose. I mean, this goose come on the side of my plane for me to use, sir. That goose like that, whoo. <laughs> Boy, if I'd have had that window unit, I'd have jerked it off and grabbed that goose by the neck. I'd have had me a goose right there. Glory to God. <laughs> they seem to like airports. They like to get on a runway that day, and that thing will shut a jet down. I mean, they, they, what, they weigh 35, 40 pounds, some of them big geese. All kinds of things of that nature. Yet God was with me. God protected me. They said he'll never have a plane. Oh, yeah, I've had three of them. Going for the fourth one. Keep living longer, believe we're going to live longer. I done told the Lord, I want to see my granddaughter's baby. I want to see her. And I want full capability and capacity. Because my granddaughter made me grand, but this one's going to make me great. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to believe God for that. That doesn't mean the devil will try to hurt me. That doesn't mean he, it doesn't make no difference. He, he can do what he want to do. He, like I told you earlier today, uh, yesterday, he, he can't walk on the water. I just stay out on the water. He stays in the boat and just screams from the boat. I just stay by Jesus. The Lord said, don't listen to him. I said, I ain't. I'm going to listen to you. And I ain't looking around at the water neither. And you're trying to figure out how I'm standing on top of the water. It's by faith anyway, so I'm going to just keep my eyes on Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Actually, when I'm seeing my eyes on Jesus, when I look beyond Jesus' head, I see all the things, all my desires, all my needs, all my wants coming to me like a tsunami. And he's got a smile on his face. I'm going to shock you. He's never turned me down one time. I have to watch what I say because I just flat get it. He's made me rich. 
See, people that, I, I'm going to say that. I'm not bragging. He has made me rich. I'm one of the richest men in the city of New Orleans. You understand what I'm saying? I don't mean that privately. God has done that. Jeez, I mean, he had, he had blessed me. I got a home, son, that makes spit fly out your mouth when you look at it. I own two plantation homes. I got a small one that's 7,300 square foot. I own that one. That's a small one. I got another one that's 40,000 square foot. Am I telling the truth, Happy? A happy genie come. Glory to God. I got a bed so high, you got to have a ladder to get in it. Am I telling you? You got to get steps. Glory to God. We got some stuff, boy. I'm not bragging on that. God been good. Everything I touched is prospered. Ah, Lord. I got to watch what I say. Because see, they were desires in my heart. I happened to go to Paris, France. And I went to Versailles. And I saw that. I thought, a ball from a trailer, eight foot wide, 32 foot trailer. I want one of them chandeliers. I got two of them, only the two left in the world. One weighed 1,100 pounds, the other weighed 700 pounds. Brown, gold, oh, it's bronze overlaid gold. I had two Russians call the other day, offered me a million dollars for my chandelier in my foyer. <laughs> Kathy said, sell, sell. <laughs> I said, I ain't selling, woman, you ain't hungry. I said, think business, woman. Let Meredith sell it. She grows up and sell it, she'll get 10, 15 million for it. I said, well, if you'd like to look at it, Kathy, I'll put the light on for you. <laughs> and I remember when I bought it, oh, you crazy? Are you out of your mind? Do you know how much money this is? Now, I didn't pay that much money by no means. I said, Kathy, I'm going to build La Maison de Rave. I'm going to build Scarlett O'Hara's home. I'm going to build that white staircase. I need that chandelier. And, I, and I, I negotiated for four years. I was dealing with some wonderful Jewish people. And I told him, look, I'm adopted. I don't pay retail. I'm in the family. I'm Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Jesus, and Jesse. I said, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. You understand? I'm with you. And the other day, the owners of that came to the house. And so they just couldn't get over it. They said, my Lord. Yeah. Gloria came and spent the night. She looked around and she goes, Jess. This is beautiful, J.S. I said, well, Gloria, pick the sweets you want. Happy calls. He says, I want the blue one. I just know. I say, fine. So when you come to my home, you pick the place you sleep. Bishop Keith Butler saw it. You should have seen his face. He walked in went. <laughs> then he looked at his wife. He said, I failed you. I said, no, you didn't fail. <laughs> you was talking about you failed it. You didn't fail it. Just I heard about that. I just, I'm not bragging. I'm giving God glory for this. What, well, how am I giving him glory? Deuteronomy 8, 18. Yeah. Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Right. And he gave me power. Yes. Power to get this. Yeah. And to establish his covenant. Do you get criticized? Yeah, I'm so glad. <laughs> Why? Because the gospel is coming to pass right in front of my eyes. I call hundredfold with persecution. But you know what? It's starting to change. I can see it happening. Now the ones that are criticizing me say, boy, it must be nice to live in something like that. I said, yes, sir, it is. But you know what? Kathy, I heard Kathy say that the other day to a person. Jesse could live in a treehouse. I could. I ain't here to impress nobody. You know, I came out of some of the poorest things you've ever seen in your life. But I thank God that my mama never saw it, but my father got to see it before he passed away. He couldn't get over that. He said, he said roll me around it. He was in a little small wheelchair. Roll me around this place, boy, boy. He never called me a man in my life. He always called me boy, boy, you have done something. I said, Dad, I hadn't done anything. He said, this is unbelievable. I said, yeah, and impossible, but it's doable. I said, Dad, this is what God will do if you'll believe. He said, take me upstairs. You got an elevator? I said, yeah. <laughs> Took him in the elevator because he couldn't walk up them steps. You know? And because, I mean, it's the, it's the gone with the wind staircase, you know? Boy, I brought him in. He goes, boy, I'm going to tell you something, boy. And he never told me what he said. <laughs> I think he learned that from people from Texas. Tell you what? And that's it. That's all you're getting out of a Texan. They don't know what what is. Tell you what? That's it. They just told you. Faith is something I like to call spiritualized common sense. So I don't think with my mind. I think with the word. Now go with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. I don't want to hold you long tonight. I want you to listen to this. 2 Kings chapter 4. 
And I find Brother Copeland and Sister Copeland in this passage of uh, scripture for me. So when you pray, you don't pay. When you pray, you believe that you receive. Now remember, I told you about that story about that preacher. Now he's in this chapter too. I'm going to prove this to you. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondsmen. Now we have to establish something in this verse. This lady's got three problems. She's in bereavement, she's in debt, and she's in bondage. Why? Why is she in bereavement? What sin did she commit? Well, we don't know. She didn't. Why? We know she's in bereavement because her husband died. Why did he die? Why did he produce these things in her life at his death? He's, she's in bereavement. She's in debt and bondage. In those times, you had what we call debtor prisons. They're coming to take her sons. They're going to take her. They're going to sell them kids. Watch this. And the creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondsmen. And Elisha said unto her, now watch this. This man now has been under the ministry of Elisha. What did Elisha preach? What was in Elisha's mouth? He was the head of the school of that prophet. You see, a man that's in debt, a man that's got financial trouble, is not going to say what this man said. And, verse 2, Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me what you have in your house. Now watch this. Let's stop for a minute. Does that sound like a man that's in debt? He don't care if she's in bereavement, debt, or money. He said, what do you want? Now, I want to ask you the question. Why did that man leave his wife in debt? Why? He should have never left that woman in debt because he was under the ministry of Elisha. Elisha was debt-free because when he could tell you, what shall I do with thee? Most preachers would have said, well, sweetheart, we know your, your husband and I will send some flowers. We've got a little widow, uh, uh, you know, account that will help you out for a little while, but that's it. Ah, Elisha didn't say that. He said, what do you want? What shall I do for thee? Tell me. Just name it. But you see, that man who was under that man's ministry all those years had never picked that up. You can have a lot of people under your ministry, but they're not hearing what you said. They heard what you said, but they're not hearing and hearing. He left that woman in debt, and he was under the ministry of Elisha. When I heard Kenneth Copeland say, oh, no man anything but to love him, you know what I thought? Is he out of his mind? How you going to buy a house without mortgaging? How you going to buy a car without financing? But when I came under Brother Copeland's ministry, I received, and Brother and Sister Gloria, I received what they said, and I'm debt free. I've been debt free so long, I don't know what debt is at all. Everything I buy is cash. I understand? I just pay for it. I don't care what it costs. It don't make no difference. Why? Because I received the laws of prosperity in my life from Kenneth and Gloria Copeland. This man got under the laws of prosperity, but never received it and died and left his wife in debt because, you see, he made her climb the mountain instead of dissolve the mountain. Bereavement, debt, and bondage is on this one. And he's under the ministry of Elisha. So I had some guy real mad not long. He said, I guess you like that Copeland guy, yet you debt-free. I said, yeah. I don't even know what my credit rating is. I don't care. I'll never use it. I told President Obama, you can have my Social Security too if you want it. And I paid a lot of Social Security in my life. I ain't going to live with no limits. You do what you want to do. I'm going to make millions and millions and millions of dollars to the day Jesus comes or the rapture of the church. It's going to happen. There ain't no other choice. It's going to be. And it is. I don't mean that pridefully. Why? Because I got under a ministry and received what they said and hearing it and hearing it and hearing it instead of just heard it. If I died tonight, Kathy can live for the rest of her life. My daughter can live for the rest of her life, and she's 42. My grandbaby's five years old, and she can live for the rest of her life. She ain't got to work a day in her life, and she's only five years old. Why? Grandfather. I'm not bragging on that. What happened? When she was born, I set her up for life. Now, I'm going to teach her to work. I'm going to show her how to work. I'm going to show her how to take money and multiply. I'm gonna, I call it the anointing of Jehovah God. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to show you this. And you, money does not define you in any way, shape, or form. You are who you are because Christ says you are. But I'll tell you one thing. You, the world, will be a servant to you instead of you being a servant to the world. Yeah. See, that's what Elisha was telling that. But that man that died did not get that. So when Brother Cook, when I realized that, I said, man, he's debt-free. I'm debt-free. 
He got a jet, I got a jet. I don't mean that private. I thought, wait a minute. See, I have, if he is preaching the right thing, it's working, ladies and gentlemen. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you want something kind of funny, the first time I preached to this Believers Convention, one of the first sermons I preached was the forgotten ingredient. Give me boldness, Lord, produces the tongue-talking church of the Bible. And Creflo Dollar was not on this front. Creflo Dollar, you can see they panning. He was way back there like this. Wow. <laughs> and i never forget the day, I, uh, right there, Bill, where you were sitting, Creflo was sitting there, and, and, I, and he leaned, Brother Copeland said, Creflo, I believe you ought to preach this service. And I, 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 I hit him with my elbow and said, your life is about ready to change big. He said, you think so? I said, I know so, brother. And look what the Lord has done through his ministry. It was a blessing. But what, why? Why? Because God's a respecter person. Why did I have a why, did, why, why do we have that? Why? Because we're better than you? No. But we received what was ministered. We refused to climb the mountain. We dissolved the mountain. We took the unbelievable and the impossible and we made it doable because the person that was teaching us said we could. But that man did not receive that from this guy named Elisha who raised somebody from the dead when he was dead. You couldn't even put nobody in the same hole. What do you mean? They just come alive. This guy had stuff in his bones. The next verse, he says, and Elisha said, verse two, what shall I do for thee? Tell me what you have in your house. Why? Because God always deals with a seed. Now she says this, thy handmaid had not anything in the house save a pot of oil. I mean, I got enough for a pancake. Look what he says. Now, the impossible, the unbelievable and the impossible is now in the old covenant here. Then he said, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels borrowed, not a few. Get every pot, pan, 55-gallon drum, bucket, anything you'll get your hand on, because God is about ready to do the unbelievable and the impossible. He's, what he's saying is my power is in my saying and my believing. Now, I like this woman. Now, verse 4 is for me. When thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons. Notice that. And shall pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. In other words, keep the fools outside. Keep the idiots outside. Don't let them get in the house. They're going to destroy your miracle. They'll destroy your dream. They, we were the dream killers. See, you know why I won't let that guy in my plane? I ain't letting that guy. I keep that boy outside my plane. No, I ain't letting that fool. Why? Because he's going to say, I, just, I can't hardly believe this is going to happen. Uh-uh. She said, shut the door. Don't let nobody look because there's always some idiot going, what you going to buy the vessels for? You're stupid. You ain't got enough to fill up a pancake. My Lord. Shut up, woman. Stay outside. Just keep the fools outside. That's walking in love. Because they will destroy your dream. And dreams have no expiration dates. I don't care how you old and how old you are tonight. You can have what you believe. But you got to say when you pray, believe. Not when you pray, pay. You understand what I'm saying? Keep the fools outside. There's so many people right now that sitting there want to come inside that house. You ain't coming in that house. No. No, 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 no. Why? Because when I needed you, I'm not going against them. I just keep the fools out. They'll destroy your dream from the inside. So just let them talk. They're going to get tired. You understand? He said, shut the door. Don't let any idiot get in there. No doubt and unbelief whatsoever at all. Now he's dealing with her. I don't doubt he told that to her husband, but he didn't receive it. But she did. Next verse. So she went from him, verse 5, shut the door upon her and upon her sons and who brought the vessels to her. Watch this. And she poured out and it came to pass. That's my favorite phrase in the Bible. But just, did you get healed? It came to pass. Right, just, <laughs> did you get it plain? It came to pass. When the vessels were full, that she said unto her. And I see a woman get excited when she sees manifestation. Bring me yet another vessel. He said, no, there is no vessel. There are no more vessels. And they all stop. I want to ask you the question. How did the oil know to stop? Because God can't give you what you will not receive. Write that down. He will not waste anything. He's Jewish. <laughs> to you, it's a fragment. To him, it's a basket. You got to realize what's around you. You may think it's nothing, but what may around you may be all the answers to your prayers, but it's in fragment form instead of full form. Pick up the fragments that we have no loss. To them, it was just junk. But to God, it was 12 baskets. The oil stop. God will not give you what you won't receive. He will not waste anything. Your power is in your saying and believing. So I don't waste money. I don't, I don't do silly things. My daughter said this so many times. Dad, how come every time you buy something, you always think an investment? I said, you better thank God, Jody. You're my only heir. She goes, oh yeah, glory to God. 
I said, everything you see, bless God, you get, you and Meredith, you set up. I said, but I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not working for y'all anymore. I'm going to work for that great grandbaby. I'm not bragging on that. See, people say, he shouldn't be talking about that. I, I am giving God glory. I remember the Lord thy God. When I walk around that house, I remember the Lord thy God. When I get in that plane Friday and begin to fly, I remember the Lord thy God. Hallelujah. It's, my eyes still swell up with tears. I get in that plane, Lord Jesus. And it was so nice the other day I did some television. Brother Colton, he said, Jesse, let me walk in your plane. I hadn't been in there in a while. I said, yeah. And, came, and he just and he said, boy, I didn't. And I could see he was pleased. Why? Well, he's the one that broke the barrier. You understand what I'm saying? And I was there when the Citation 10 came in, you understand? We were on a motorcycle trip in Montana. I'm aboard the director. It just so happened Jerry didn't, wasn't on that one. And I tell you, when Cessna flew in that plane I, and brought it there as a, 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 I guess a test run to see Brother Copeland sitting, I saw him stand out there like that. And I could see that dream coming to pass right in his eyes. I said, oh God, look at this. But he put me in a rock and a hard place. You gotta understand, when, when you work with Kendall Coleman, you better be instant in season, out of season. Because he's going to do something. And when God tells him to do it, he don't care. He don't care where he's at. He don't make no difference. He's going to do what the Lord said. The guys came in. They said, would you like to uh, take, her, take her out and fly? Well, yeah. He comes up like he said, boy, Jesse, I love this plane. I said, I'm, I said it's beautiful. He said, now, Jesse, I'm going to fly this plane. I want you to get back and pray. And when we get back on the ground, tell me what the Lord says. See if this is the one. Now, why did he say that? Because I have the responsibility as a board of the director to understand the vision of this ministry, KCM. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not just on there just to be friends. We are friends, but this is business. This is serious. So what's that? I couldn't enjoy the flight. Heads, Kenneth and Glory, they just enjoy it. I'm back there. And the devil said, you're going to miss it. I'll tell you, where you are not Lord Jesus. And man, my Lord, I thought, well, maybe he forgot because he got so excited, you know. Before the plane landed, I tell you, he turned around. What the Lord said? Let's pray in the Holy Ghost here. Cool. <laughs> Give it to him by prophetic utterance, Lord Jesus. I said, Brother Coleman, this is it. He said, I knew it. It's mine. And it was that very day. Now, did they fly it out that day? Yeah, they flew it out, do whatever they need to do. But that day was his. I walked out that plane and I thought, man, I was here when the first preacher that I know of bought a brand new plane. Another barrier had been busted and obliterated and broken. And I was there to see it. I got so excited. I went to a place. We went back to the hotel. I went across. I wasn't even hungry. I went to uh, something, fish and chips. I can't think of it. I said, give me a piece of fish. I got to bite something, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I was so excited. I tore up that fish, man. <laughs> they said, oh, you hungry? I said, man, I just come out of a jet. A what? Yeah. Give me another piece of fish. <laughs> I'll tell you, I wasn't even hungry. I was just biting the fish. Lord Jesus. Man, I was there. Unbelievable. Impossible. Doable. But he always said it. His power was in his saying and in his believing. I picked that up. Both of us were believing for planes at the same time. I mean, it was amazing, but I mean, we wasn't racing to see who gets it. it had none of that. Because I realized if God's going to put me around a prophet of God, he expecting me to listen to what the prophet is saying. Instead of just having a relationship. Now, why did that lady get so blessed? She trusts God's person and she trusted God's power. Now, watch this. When you've been in poverty and bereavement, bondage and debt, now she's out of it. I mean, you, do you understand the oil industry start? There's Texaco, Chevron, Exxon, they're all everywhere. Did you notice what Elijah did? Look at this. Verse 7, she came and told the man of God. He didn't stay there to wait to see if the miracle was going to take place. He went home. She had to go get him. She, had to go, she, she came and told the man. He done went home. He wasn't saying, oh, Jesus, if you don't do this, I'm going to look like the biggest idiot that I was in shoe leather or shoe sandals. Oh, God help. No, Elijah went home. She had to go to his house. She said, I tell you, now watch it. When you've been in bondage and bereavement debt so long, you don't even realize you have an answer. She goes, what should I do? I love Elisha. Sell the oil. Sell the oil. That's the opportunity. Sell the oil. Why would she have, why could she figure that out for herself? Just sell the oil, woman. Pay your debt and live for you and your son for the rest of your life. Now she got a two generation full blessing. But if she'd have believed the word of God, a good man, a good person makes an inheritance for his children's children. She could have got it three fives. 
Do you know how many years that is in today's economy? That's 240 years. Ma'am, you have, you, sir, and both have 240 years of financial blessing in you. Because you see, your child should never, you have, are y'all married? Or do you want to know this woman? I, I didn't do it to you. I don't know. If you're, <laughs> y'all married? Okay. You know, hey, I'm going to try to help the man out here. Glory to God. <laughs> I don't know. Watch this. My daughter will never spend her money. She's going to spend mine. My granddaughter is not going to spend her mama's money. Going to spend mine. A good man. Am I a good man, Kathy? Leaves an inheritance for his children's children. The average person lives 80 years old, 75 to 80 years old average. Why is that? Because nobody's hardly ever preaching the, hundred, uh, the 120 years of that. See, 80 times 3 is what? 240 years, right? 80 times 3 is 24. Watch this. You know, we start preaching 120 years, people can start living to 120 years. But we preached something that was wrong. I mean, I didn't, but a lot of people said, you know, God gives you 70 years and by reason of strength, 80. That was done when it was in rebellion. That's right. But the, the lifespan of a man is 120 years. I believe it's Genesis 5 or Genesis 6. But see, nobody, you can't have faith for something that hadn't been preached to you. You couldn't get healed if somebody preached healing to you. You couldn't get saved if somebody preached salvation to you. You couldn't get blessed if somebody preached prosperity to you. Now, I don't care what happens. You are the person that makes the choice. Not God, you. You. He said, I put for you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life, please. Now, he don't want you to choose death. He don't want you to choose curse. But see, that's all within your power, and God will do what you say. But when are you going to do what he says? So I got 240 years in me. Now, I'm teaching that. I've taught that to Jody, and I'm, we're teaching that to Meredith. See, so by, by the time, if you truly understand this, they ain't no, they're not going to, by the time they start spending Jody's money and, and Jay's money, Lord, G, Jesus will probably already come. Don't you, did I blow your head off right there? I think I blew your head off right there. Yeah, I can see you going. That's unbelievable. Yeah. That's impossible. Yeah. But that's doable. I remember when I, I couldn't buy a five cent Coke. And when it went up to six cents, I said, that's it. I can't never drink a Coca-Cola again. You remember when it went up to six cents? Anybody remember when a Coke went up to six cents? I thought, that's all I got, it's a nickel. I ain't got a penny. I, I, I got to drink Kool-Aid now. <laughs> Can I say something that sounds arrogant? I guess unless I bought a business. If, if I just wanted something, I, I'll never get through my money. I mean, now, if I went by a business, that's a whole nother ballgame. But I'm just talking about stuff. I don't get shook up when Kathy goes shopping. She do what she wants. I don't mean that pride for I'm giving God glory for this. I learned that through the laws of prosperity, of sowing and reaping. Don't get mad at me if I obeyed biblically what God said I could have. Who do you think you are? Well, I'm telling you who I am. Now, some people say that's arrogance and cockiness. No, it's not. It's, it's physical manifestation. I've had many opportunities to fail. I just don't take any. I'll never forget. They said, we want you to go on a motorcycle trip. Go buy a motorcycle. What did I do? I went buy a motorcycle. I didn't say, oh, Jesus. Oh, Lord, how much a motorcycle cost? I just went and I said, I like that blue one. Give me that one right there. Wash it. The other day, somebody sideswiped Kathy. Actually, I was driving the car. I mean, this woman decides she's going to get it. What? She knocked the uh, window off. The, Kathy got a Mercedes Benz, knocked it off like that. I got out the car, and I'm standing in the middle of the road. People, I forget that people know me because I'm on television a lot in New Orleans. Hey, but just say, do, do. I'm in the middle of the road, you know. So I, I was going to do like the cops. All right, we're walking. Come on. Right, right. You know, finally, they come the cop and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and they're trying to figure all this stuff out. And, and to make a long story short, I said, Kathy, uh, they said, oh, we can fix that. I said, Mercedes-Benz dealership right down the road. You want to go buy a new car? I'll get this one fixed. I was just, I told the cop, drive me over there, i buy a new car. I'm not pr being bragging on that. I, she goes, oh, no, Jesse. You know, this, all we got to do is change that, that, that mirror and all that kind of stuff. I said, well, whatever you want to do. I said, you want to buy it? I'll go buy it right now. I said, I, I said, it's two blocks down the road. I said, we're waiting on the guy anyway. I said, just drive me over there. I'll buy you a brand new. We'll drive that one, take that one. And I'll get somebody. I'll call one of the staff and they'll drive that and they'll bring in and get it fixed. Okay, I said, oh, no, 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 can't do that. that that's, that's just too much money. 
until we got home. <laughs> then we got home. See, it's thinking. She's getting the thing. She's going. Would you buy me a new car? I said, yeah, if you want one. She said, do you want me to have it? <laughs> I said, that's what I live for. You want a new car? We'll go get the thing. I said, we're home now. It's probably closed. I said, we'll, we'll, we'll go tomorrow and get the thing. She kept thinking about it. She said, what, could I, what would I do with this one? I said, well, you want it? Give it to someone else. Sell it? Well, I don't know. Whatever you want to do. I don't, I don't care. She goes, you know, I went too fast on that. I shouldn't have said no. Let me think about it. <laughs> I said, fine, think about it. You make your decision, it's fine. I'm not bragging on that. I know I'm going to get some ugly letters on that. I didn't heed it. No, I'm giving God glory. Do you understand? Amen. Thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power. Jesus. Nathaniel Wolf, he's here tonight, him and his wife, Michelle, wonderful people. I said, Nate, I'm going to tell you something, because you're around me and you're getting out of debt. You know why I know that without a shadow of a doubt? Because I got around Brother Copeland. And he said, you can be debt free. Oh, no man, anything but the loving. Whew. I said, okay. Now, that doesn't work on Wall Street. Because you work money on Wall Street. I understand that. I got, I got a lot of money on Wall Street. I watch that every time. Kathy's always like, what are you doing? I'm watching. I'm watching. Yeah, you know, I've, I've invested in some of those things. And, and people always say, what you invest in? I ain't telling nobody. Because if they lose some money, they're mad at me. And if they make some money, I don't get any of it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, hey, you do your own business, I'm going to do my own business. But watch it. And I know that's not the normal way people deal with. They, deal, they work other people's money, go to banks and things. Like that. I don't know. Why not you be the bank? Jerry Savelle preached that I could be the man with the water pitcher. You preached that. I thought, well, bless God, instead of, why, why can't I? See, once something's preached to you, you, remember, you have the faith to receive it. But if you do like that man and be under a ministry like KCM and not receive what they said, the day will come when you're going to leave somebody in major trouble. But if you just do, and I'm not just saying that because they, we're friends. If you just do what they said, if you just do what Jesus said, this is what he believes you can do. He believes that. He just believes that. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. And the same thing with grace. I, don't, I never feel bad about myself. And I close with this statement. And many of y'all know this because I, I, I ministered this at the minister's conference. Devil, I mean, <laughs> devil was going to try to take me out last year. The, the week right after um, Thanksgiving. And the, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me. He said, go get yourself checked out. You have any symptoms? No, nah, I had nothing. I just had a tingling. So I went to the smartest doctors in New Orleans. They said, they ran me through tests real quickly. And they said, there's nothing wrong with you. I said, Holy Ghost spoke to him. Now, when you tell a doctor that, a heart surgeon, they look at you, you lost your mind. They said, you know, you, you, know, you know what you just did on a treadmill? We took your body. We took you up to, how old are you? I said, I was 63. He said, we took your body up to 180 beats a minute running. And my God, man, duh, 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 duh. you passed nuclear tests, you passed everything. I said, Doc, listen to me. Listen to me. Something ain't right. Something ain't right. Well, you have chest pain? No. Do you have shortness of breath? No. You have cold sweat? No, I don't have that. Nothing. Something's not right. Keep, keep looking. Finally, I said, is there anything I haven't done? Yeah, we, there's one test, but we don't like to do it because it's a, what's the word he use? It's a, uh, it's evasive, invasive. invasive, whatever that is, yeah. And sure enough, when they did that test, I was born with a crossed artery. I had an artery that was crossed like this. I didn't know it. Maybe somebody might, way back when. And she blocked here. And she blocked it. Now this, is, I didn't have a chance to call nobody, tell anybody. I said, well, how do we fix it? I was on the table. I could see all my insides on this video. That's really something to see your heart going. And I thought about the coffee Sanka commercial. That's what I thought of. I thought. And I heard these two doctors. You know, if he was a normal man, I said, excuse me, excuse me. What do you mean by normal? Well, my God, if you did have had a normal job, but you're in that plane all the time with your under pressurization. All kind, I didn't never thought about that, all kind of things. 
He said, you were probably born like that. He said, if we could put a stent there and open that up, but we don't know what's underneath here. I said, how do we fix this? He said, the biggest operation anybody can go through. I said, what's that? You gotta remember, the only time I've been in the hospital is when I was born. They slapped me as a baby. I hadn't been back since. <laughs> 63 years later, I showed back up. He said, open heart surgery. I said, what you doing tomorrow? He said, man, you make fast decisions. I said, what are you doing tomorrow? He said, I guess I'm working on you. I said, yeah, good, thank you. Had no fear, no nothing. They told Kathy, four to six hours to do this. Two hours and 15 minutes. He's gonna be at least two days in intensive care, five hours. I walked in and there's, the he goes, my God, you standing up? I said, yeah. Never had no heart attack, nothing. They fixed it. He said, we used your mammary artery. I said, you did what? I didn't know a man had a mammary artery. I always thought a woman had a mammary artery. I said, you use my mammary artery? Yeah. He said, and we took a vein out your leg. And I looked at my leg, I went, whoa. Don't think bad about this, that every time my foot itches, I scratch my chest. <laughs> it's not, it's not. <laughs> no, it's a joke, it's a joke. But nobody they took it out of my leg. <laughs> But you know who it affected more than anybody? I had tubes coming out of me, and I mean, sound is a tech. I am a textbook case that's still talking about it. No print, nothing. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm doing 17 miles a week when I treadmill kicking. I got treadmill in, in my room right now. I, I, I can't go down to the thing because people won't let me work out. You know, they want me to sign their Bible. It's hard running to sign a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't easy. So, you know, I got me one in my, in my room there. Now watch this, I mean, they just can't get over that. They just can't get over that. I told him, I said, it's the Holy Ghost. You understand? God spoke to me. Be sensitive when God speaks. Well, it's all healed up, and I mean, all that kind of stuff. And, I mean, it just, it's amazing. He looked at me, he says, Reverend, you could eat pork every day for the next 40 years. You are not gonna plug up what we did. Now, I'm not gonna do that. I said, well, thank you, I appreciate that. He said, he said, we made you 20 years old inside. I said, really? I said, Kathy. <laughs> hey, man. I got my lead back, brother. <laughs> hey, what's up, baby? Hey. She said, shut up, you old fool. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> It's, it's been amazing, but I listen to the voice of God. Just listen to the voice of God. That's it. Unbelievable and impossible. You know who it affected more than anybody? Jody, my daughter. She saw me with the wires and the tubes. So I'm just sitting there smiling like that, and I see her going, I said, Jody, what's wrong? She said, Dad, you are invincible. Because anything went wrong, I said, I'll fix it. i take care of it. You got a problem, I take it. No make no difference. I don't care. Somebody messed with you, they mess with me. I take care of everything. Just let me know. I did that. Said, you got no problems. El Shaddad, you understand? <laughs> take care of everything. Somebody messed with you, they mess with me. I'm gonna make them an offer they don't refuse. <laughs> I mean, I went to school, son. And I shouldn't have done that. And I mean, I got mad one time and this <laughs> secretary would let me in. I pushed it aside. Tell your husband I did that. We're going to call the police. I said, get an ambulance. We're going to need that too. <laughs> I reached across that desk to that princess. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to say this one time. You understand me? I don't play no games. You mess with me. And I heard the Lord say, what do you do for a living? I'm a motivational speaker. <laughs> I didn't want to say I was a preacher. But see, that was my weakness, Jerry. I, oh, you touched my daughter. Touched my girl. That guy got, oh. Well, you know, she said, Dad, you invincible. I realized she had never seen me like that. So I waited about an hour and a half. She went home. I called. I said, Jody, this is Daddy. Yeah, Dad, what you want? I am invincible. Don't you worry about anything. I'm here for a long, long time. Amen. See, I said that, that sometimes if you get shook up, And you think God ain't coming to your rescue? You think, but God's invincible. Just wait an hour or so. He'll call you. Mm -hmm. He won't have tubes coming up. He'll say, I am invincible. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy it tonight? Yes. 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 Glory.